Thank you for joining us today for our presentation on finding respite moments while in isolation. We hope you find this informative and that you are able to take away something to help you find those respite moments in your day. Respite is a common term that we hear from time to time throughout our lives. It's often used in different contexts and different spaces and is rolled up into caregiver support. But one of the key questions that we always wonder is, what exactly is respite and why do I need it? So in the first part of this presentation, we're going to review what respite is and why it's so important that you find moments of respite during this pandemic. When we talk about respite in the developmental service sector, we're typically talking about one of three things. We're either talking about recreation or day respite. Those are your programs that your child attends that give you a bit of a break. That could be anything from a sports program, an after school program, your evening and weekend events, as well as your winter, March and summer break camps. Residential respite is a program that allows your child to stay overnight and gives you a full period of break. Those under the 18 in the city of Toronto can access respite beds over the weekend, and that's typically a period of Friday afternoon to Sunday afternoon. For those who are 18 plus, you can access respite beds all week long. However, during the weekdays, you have to have somewhere to go during the day. That could be something like a work program, a post-secondary course, or a day program. And what you're probably most common with or have heard the most about are individualized respite workers. Those are people who come into your home, take your child out for an activity, or just help out at home depending on what the activity of the day is. But during the pandemic, we're very aware that you don't have access to any of these respite supports right now. So when we talk about respite today, we're literally talking about the definition of respite. And that is defined as a period of temporary delay or an interval of rest and relief. So for today's presentation, we're going to focus on how you can find those periods of delay and those moments of rest and relief while you're stuck in isolation at home. Lately, the phrase, the new normal, is being thrown around a lot in the media. We're hearing about it in terms of how we're going to reopen the province, what's going to happen when we have to return to work, and even how our day-to-day -day activities are going to be affected by this new normal. The one thing that's not being talked about, though, is how this new normal is creating a new set of challenges for families and caregivers who are supporting those with developmental disabilities. Having surveyed several families, there are some common themes that are starting to trend in the developmental service sector. We wish to outline them below. So we want to acknowledge that the new normal for many of our individuals and caregivers is a new normal of increased behaviors or the introduction of new behaviors. This is very stressful for the individual who is struggling to communicate their needs, as well as the caregiver who may feel that they need external support to help determine what the best response is for these needs. It's an emotional time for caregivers and those that they're supporting. Many of our loved ones, including our children, are struggling with feelings that may be foreign to them or feelings that they've had before but are now being exacerbated by the pandemic. Lots of individuals are feeling isolated, depressed, and many are feeling alone. 
This emotional turmoil is not only stressing the individual, but the caregivers who are watching their loved ones struggle and feeling like they do not have the right tools to support the emotional needs of their children and anybody else in their care. Many parents are reporting frustration with the regression of their children's skills. We understand that this can be very overwhelming for any family. Parents and caregivers are now left to grieve the loss of these skills, and there's a lot of uncertainty as to whether or not their loved one will be able to acquire these skills again after the pandemic is over. The lack of play space and outdoor space has created a lot of challenges for our children, especially those active ones who need space to run around. And it's also impacting our ability as caregivers to provide the right level of care because we do require that personal space throughout the day to take a break and to calm down. We're not able to do that when we're locked inside in a pandemic, and this can often lead to marital breakdowns, family breakdowns, and oftentimes crisis in the family home. We also know that this is a very difficult time for siblings who are trying to vie for the attention of their caregivers, but are also trying to be respectful of the fact that their sibling does require more attention and more support. And of course, with that comes the parental guilt of feeling like one child is being supported more than other. Finally, the new demands of online learning have created a lot of challenges for families. There have been a lot of technical issues that have need to be learned and overcome. And there's also been a report of a lot of lack of appropriate curriculum for some of our children in specialized classrooms. We will now discuss the effects of stress and how this new normal impacts our physical and mental health and reduces our ability to cope day to day. If cortisol is elevated for a long period of time, such in situations with chronic stress, it can really cause harm to your body. Elevated blood sugar, which could help in a very stressful situation, can lead to diabetes if it's elevated for too long. Elevated blood pressure can also lead to hypertension or high blood pressure. Decreased inflammation can impair your immune system, so you aren't able to fight infections as easily. The effects of stress on your body can affect your brain, your heart, your stomach, your pancreas, your intestines, and your reproductive organs. For your brain and your nerves, you could have problems with irritability, nervousness, anxiety, depression, panic attacks, or feelings of despair, low energy, sadness, or difficulty sleeping, or remembering things, difficulty concentrating, or headaches. For your heart, your heart could beat faster, you could have palpitations, you could have a rise in your blood pressure, increased risk of cholesterol or heart attack. For your stomach, you could have effects on your appetite, you could have nausea or stomach aches. For your pancreas, you could have an increased risk of diabetes. For your intestines, you could have diarrhea or constipation or other problems. For many women who are parenting a child with disability, they could have difficulty with their period, so they could be not regular. Um, a lot of times they mention that there are a lot of issues with their regularity of their periods. They could have more pain and it's very challenging for them. Other issues could be skin problems or acne, muscle aches, increased risk of bone density issues, which again, impact your ability to recover from illness.
We are now going to discuss strategies for improving your health habits, tackling your stress, and lowering your risk of having poor health. To review, chronic stress can lead to increased cortisol, which results in issues with weight gain, difficulty sleeping, diabetes, high blood pressure, reduced energy levels, impaired immune response, issues with your mood, attention, and concentration, and affecting your ability to cope. The effects of cortisol can have an impact on your mood, your liver, your digestion, it could lead to osteoporosis, could have an effect on your pituitary gland, your blood sugar, your blood pressure, and lead to allergic reactions. Here's one example of a tool that you can use right away. It's called a healthy habit log. It helps you keep track of your healthy habits, helps you stick to a goal. It's a visual. It can help you with your daily routine. It impacts how you feel, and it's a great resource to help you feel better. So other ideas could include the fitness apps. So it could be the Fitbit or any other app that could keep you on track, having a sleep journal, having a calendar or reminder app, having an online fitness journal or fitness challenge with other people could really help keep you motivated. We will now discuss strategies for dealing with the mental strain arising from isolation. One type of therapy that can be used is called acceptance and commitment therapy. It encourages people to embrace their thoughts and feelings instead of fighting or feeling guilty for them. It invites people to open up to unpleasant feelings and not overreact to them or avoid situations where those feelings come up. It's an intervention that uses acceptance and mindfulness strategies together with commitment and behavior change strategies to increase flexibility. One component of acceptance is called affirmations. Those are the things that you say to yourself that could help yourself feel better. So things you could say to yourself are expecting more behaviors from your kids at this time because this is a very difficult time for everyone. Give yourself a bit of time. Say to yourself, well, we're all adjusting right now and this is a very difficult time. Use this as an opportunity to relearn about each other and form new relationships with your family. Give yourself to permission to acknowledge that this is a very difficult time. Take the time you need just for yourself. Know that this is not going to last forever. Use this time to reflect for yourself. Be mindful and be in the moment. Whether it's taking that walk in nature and really focusing in on something with the sound or the senses when you're in your walk, it's really important to try to stay mindful and in the moment. RAIN is a coping strategy that can be used to help deal with the situation. It is a mindfulness strategy called the RAIN of self-compassion. It's a standalone meditation, but you can also move through the steps whenever challenging feelings arise. The R in RAIN stands for recognize. Take a moment to recognize that a strong emotion is present and gently turn toward what you're experiencing in an open and non-judgmental way. Tune into the present moment experience of what's happening in your body and your mind, your feelings, your thoughts and sensations that are here. It may be helpful to mentally name it. For example, to say, I'm feeling stressed or I am feeling overwhelmed. This recognition of what you're feeling opens up your inner space and brings you into full contact with yourself and the actuality of the present moment. The A stands for allow. Allowing means to let it be as it is. It's the acknowledgement and acceptance of your present moment reality. Allowing doesn't mean we have to like the situation. It means we have to soften or drop our resistance to what's happening. 
The reason this is so important is because we have the impulse to push away, suppress or ignore difficult feelings. When we get into inner struggles with these ways, we create more suffering and tension. In this struggle, we also tend to get caught up in our thoughts and feelings. Therefore, we're more likely to react rather than choose a conscious response. By allowing, we're able to bring an inner yes to our present moment experience. You may almost immediately notice a sense of softening and ease around that emotion. The I and RAIN stands for investigate. Now that you've recognized and allowed this emotion, you can choose to investigate it. You may not always feel the need for the I step as sometimes just the recognition and acceptance is enough. At other times, you may feel naturally drawn to using this step. So to investigate, you might can mentally inquire with questions like, why do I feel the way I do? Are there events that happened ahead of the emotion that might have influenced it? Are there physiological factors such as not getting enough sleep that are affecting the emotion? What do I really need right now? Are there actions I could take to nurture and support myself or others in this difficult time? These questions can help us come into a wiser relationship with emotions and thoughts. With this process of investigation, we can also choose a conscious response to foster a more meaningful life. Investigation may even resolve and dissolve the feeling completely. The N stands for non-identification. In the end step of RAIN, you turn your attention to the simple realization that you are not your mind nor your emotions. You are awareness that underneath every thought, feeling, and sense perception, there is something going on. Non-identification means that your sense of who you are is not fused with or defined by your thoughts and feelings. This brings about a natural sense of freedom and ease. It gives a sense of peace in the middle of it all. No matter how intense and painful the emotional storm is, there's a part of you which is still silent and untouched. You can use this RAIN method anytime you're feeling stressed, overwhelmed, or out of touch. It's a powerful way to deal with feelings in this very challenging time. One part of acceptance and commitment therapy is mindfulness. That is the practice of purposely focusing your attention on the present moment and accepting it without judgment. It can also reduce stress and bring about overall happiness. The idea behind mindfulness is maintaining a moment by moment awareness of our thoughts, feelings and body and surrounding environment. It means acceptance so that we pay attention to our thoughts and feelings without judgment. When we practice mindfulness, our thoughts tune in to what we're sensing in the present moment instead of being focused on the past or reimagining the future. Some activities can include deep breathing, grounding, visualization, and affirmations, calming, and sensory activities. As you can see with the visual here, we have an example of a grounding technique. So you'd have five things you can see, four things you can feel, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, and one thing you can taste. Here's another mindfulness moment activity that you can try even tonight for five minutes. It's a breathing technique called the awareness of breath exercise. It helps reduce stress and lower your cortisol. So to do the awareness of breath practice, you need to sit comfortably, still your body, settle your mind, attend to your breathing, notice your attention wandering and gently coming back and repeat. It's important that we take care of ourselves. When we take care of ourselves first, we can take care of others in our life even better. Self-care is a good strategy for reducing your stress, anxiety, and feeling overwhelmed. There are many benefits to having self-care. It helps reduce stress, which lowers our cortisol, which reduces our risk of long-term health issues and strengthens our immunity to COVID. It improves our quality of sleep and replenishes our energy levels and improves concentration, your focus and your mood. It improves your ability to cope with challenging situations in a calm and rational way and helps you deal with healthy relationships in your own life. 
Self-care is not about being selfish or indulgent. It's how we keep ourselves well to ensure that we're physically, emotionally, and mentally capable of being there for our family. Anxiety, worry, and grief are so normal during an event like this. Feeling overwhelmed by the smallest task is to be expected. Take time to notice your feelings. Pause and reflect before responding to a family member. When you feel like you need to get calmer, try taking a few deep breaths to clear your head or try mindfulness activity to restore your sense of calm. Limit your exposure to news to maybe an hour a day. Reach out to a healthcare professional if you feel like you need some support around your physical or mental health concerns. It might feel impossible to get a break because you're home together all the time. Work on a plan to co-parent and share some caregiving time so that each of you have time alone. Work on creating daily schedules to allow you to work while keeping your children safe and busy. Schedules in terms of who does what may need to change on a daily basis, so plan each day in advance, but also be flexible. If you are parenting on your own, try to schedule some quiet time for yourself. Here are some examples of how you can take care of yourself. From treating yourself, to focusing on your growth, to paying attention to nature, stargazing, focusing on things that make you happy, reading, spending time in the sunshine, spring cleaning, or having a nourishing morning routine, going for a walk, playing with your pet, going outside, just to spend time on the outdoors, and planning something to look forward to. Here are some self-care activities for children with special needs, from listening to nature sounds, to nature scenes, changing the temperature, using guided meditation, giving them soft lighting, using a sleeping mask, using noise canceling headphones, giving them scents that they enjoy, giving them weighted blankets or guided meditation. If they are able to share their feelings, that could help them encourage self-awareness, help them articulate how they feel if they are verbal, giving them some time for low stress or solo activities, encouraging journaling, drawing, or writing, recognizing when things can get stressful, helping them practice self-care, cultivating their interest, encouraging them to focus on the moment, and exposing them to other social groups that they might belong to. To help caregivers cope, we have to think about strategies and ideas for ourselves. Remember what we said about acceptance. This is a very traumatic and unprecedented time. It's okay if we need the time to adjust and process all of this change. Allow yourself to experience these emotional changes and remind yourself it's okay to feel this way. Validate your feelings because they are real, expected and allowed. Keep up your daily routines and structure. Take the time you need for yourself. Create a to-do list every day to keep your priorities on track and help you manage your responsibilities. It also helps keep you focused and gives you meaning to each day and motivate you to get out of bed every morning. Try to let go of those feelings of guilt. Those are things that are not within your control. Think about it. You're doing the best you can and all that's being asked of you. To help children cope, normalize and validate their feelings of loss. Talk to them about what's bothering them. Discuss who they want to connect to and how do they do that. Whether it's FaceTime or Skype or any other virtual means, help them connect to their friends, their family members, their grandparents virtually. It will help them bring them a sense of hope. Be open about the grief of their old life. Model what you're doing. Know that we do have our dark mood and low days. Normalize that. There are resources for children and siblings. Help them access the Kids Help Phone website. Monitor their sleep and appetite and help them enjoy them things that they have pleasure in. Check for whether they're feeling anxious or depressed about things and try to spend one-to-one -one time with each child. 
try to use a feelings chart to help them identify their feelings. It helps them ask what they're feeling and how they're feeling now. Help them point to that feeling. You could also use a traffic light to help them share how intense their feeling is. A red light means they're feeling very overwhelmed. A yellow light is medium and a green light is okay. You can also use telemedicine for doctor's appointments. To help children cope, there are great resources out there. Books Beyond Words is a free resource for children with special needs. It's a book designed for children with special needs without words. It can help them identify some of their feelings. The coronavirus book for children is also a great resource. The Feelings Wall Mirror helps them identify some of their feelings. By using the emotion stones, as you can see, you can have a visual depiction of how they're feeling. There's also the Emotions Interactive Circular Carpet that can help them identify their feelings in a visual manner. To help children cope, another technique could be to use a Lego I Feel chart. This resource allows a child to communicate how they feel by choosing from a range of emotion heads for their Lego man. It helps with identifying feelings and could be used to help a child communicate how they feel about different options. Now that we've discussed those self-care strategies, we want to try and tackle some of the problems that are occurring around working from home and learning from home. In this section, we're going to look at the best ways to manage your environment in order to have a productive work and school day while at home. Trying to juggle the demands of caregiving along with trying to work from home can be very overwhelming for caregivers. So one of the best ways to tackle that and have a productive day is to set up a work environment at home that mimics the environment that you have at work. Ensure you have all your supplies ready for the day before you start so that you can reduce the amount of times that you have to get up and walk away mid work. Try and find a space where you can reduce noise distraction by closing windows and doors. Make sure that you're working at a table and not on a couch or a bed. It's very easy to get into that loungy feeling when you're working in a bed or a couch and it can be very hard to redirect yourself back to the actual productive work at hand. So try and use a desk the same way that you would at work. Set up and test out your technologies the night before so that you don't run into any problems when you're trying to participate in those remote meetings. While you're setting up your environment, look around and ask yourself, what are the things in here that are in common with my space at work and what are different? Try and tackle the things that are different by removing them from the room. So for example, if you don't have a TV in your office at work, you shouldn't be working in a room with the TV at home. Now, we acknowledge that this is not so simple for many families, depending on the size of the space that you're living in. But a simple hack around this can be to unplug the TV from the wall and make a house rule that from Monday to Friday, between the hours of nine to five, the TV doesn't get plugged in and ensure that everyone understands that expectation. This will reduce those outside distractions from taking your attention away from your work. Try designating one room in the house to be your boardroom. Have everybody in the family involved in this process and explain to everyone that when you're in the boardroom, you have to treat this as uninterrupted time. So this is similar to booking out a boardroom at work when you have a big meeting to attend. This is a really great tool to use, especially when you have multiple people working in the home or when you have those teenagers who are trying to finish their secondary school work and maybe have those group projects to work on. Find a room in the house where you can close the door, make a sign together that says boardroom and put it up on the door. And then you can simply make a sign out sheet that you put up so that people can essentially sign out the boardroom for a period of an hour or two where they know that during that time they can use that space for quiet work or to work on remote meetings and remote projects. This is a great way to maintain routine and structure and to set those expectations so that your children understand that when you are in that room and that boardroom sign is up, they know that they are not to bother you during that period of time. 
Finally, it's really important that you follow the same routine that you use during the workday to go to work now while you're at home. So stick to the same schedule with starting and ending your day at the same time. Take your lunch break at the same time and go about your day the same way you would if you were at the office. Make sure you wake up at the same hour every morning. So if you were typically waking up at 6.30 beforehand, you should still be doing so now. Follow your same morning routines. Take a shower, get dressed, get ready for the day. It's very important that we change out of our pajamas and our sweatpants and those things that we lounge in in our free time and put on a pair of fresh clothing. Sometimes that's all you need to get on the right foot to start the day. So stick to those routines because those routines create structure, familiarity for you and allow you to set the best foot forward to start your day with. Now let's talk about the learning environment at home. For starters, we as caregivers have to revisit some of that acceptance therapy when it comes to the learn at home curriculum. There are a lot of things that are out of our control and are very frustrating at times. Not having access to the right technology, not knowing how to use it at the start, feeling like your child is not accessing adequate curriculum or feeling like you're not getting enough one-to-one -one support with your teachers based on the restrictions at hand are all things that we may have to grapple with and learn to accept. So find ways to be innovative while still giving your child an opportunity to learn. Maybe now is not the time to push book curriculum on your children. Maybe you can engage them with some virtual tours of museums where they can look at specific topics. Maybe you can find a planetarium that's doing online shows where you can look at the stars and do a little assignment there. Find the things that are going to interest your child and that will be used to motivate them to participate in that learning process. Set small and reasonable goals and celebrate when they are accomplished. So maybe your goal is simply to get an hour of learning a day in. That's okay to set such small goals because it's realistic and it's achievable. When your child does complete that hour, make sure to celebrate that and give a lot of verbal praise so that you're rewarding the fact that that child participated in a learning behavior that you wanted to see. That continuous verbal praise will in essence eventually encourage your child to do a little bit more and you can slowly build up tolerance over time using those reinforcers. Now another way for your child to achieve success at home is to set up the learning environment in a similar to way to how you set up your work environment. So for starters, Find a space where your child can sit free of distraction. Look for a place where you can limit noise exposure. Maybe find a room where you can close the door or windows if need be. Gather all your supplies before the start of the day and set up all your technology and test it out. This will reduce the likeliness that your child needs to get up and wander away looking for something. And that reduces the temptation to walk away and not come back. Look in the current environment that your child is working in and ask yourself, what in this environment would I see in a classroom and what wouldn't I? For those things that you wouldn't typically see, maybe it's the TV, maybe it's a gaming system, maybe it's just the child's toys in the background, try and remove them from the environment wherever possible. And if you can't, unplug them and make the same house rule for your child that you would make for yourself. For those who typically learn through modeling, lead by example whenever possible. Maybe set up in a general space like your dining room or kitchen table. Take one side and set up your work and leave the other side for your child to set up their learning space. Sit and attend to your work and model that behavior of what you expect for your child to do with their learning curriculum. Your child is more likely to attend to their homework when they're modeling the behavior from you. Like you, maintaining that weekday routine and structure is incredibly important for a child to have success. A lot of the children that we support do rely heavily on the routine and structure that they develop at school. And this can be a very anxiety ridden time because they don't have access to practicing those typical routines and structures. So wherever possible, call up your teacher and ask what the typical Monday to Friday schedule looks like. Try whatever you can to mimic that. So if, for example, every Monday morning, there's math followed by a snack, followed by reading and gym, every Monday morning, your child should wake up and be asked to work on a little bit of math, then be given a snack break, 
then be given a little bit of reading and finally finish it off with a little bit of activity time before lunch. This creates predictability for your child, keeps them on track with that routine, and it's going to reduce the stressors associated with that transition back to school in the fall. Try to treat the work, the school and work hours the same way that you would if your child was actually attending to school. So mimic the same schedules, keep the same routines, and make sure that your child is up and dressed and wearing clean, fresh clothing and not attending to their schoolwork in their pajamas. For those kids who need a little bit more motivation, go back to the basics. Pull out your token economies and your reinforcers and use them to encourage your children to attend to their schoolwork, especially in those moments where you notice that your child is getting bored or losing focus. Always reinforce good behavior with verbal praise, especially for those with youth in care. And remember to use a reward system to motivate an unmotivated child. Always acknowledge the completion of work and always celebrate any successes, whether big or small, that your child is able to achieve in the day. Now that we've discussed the effects of stress on our body and our mind, we've reviewed some ideas on how you can practice self-care, and we've suggested strategies on improving your physical and mental well-being during these stressful times. We're now ready to talk about ways that you can incorporate respite into your day-to-day -day despite being stuck at home during this pandemic. So we've come up with several creative ideas that we're hoping can inspire you to find those few moments in the day to practice self-care. We acknowledge that not every tip and trick will work for every family or every household setting, but we hope you walk away with a few creative suggestions that you can take back and apply in hopes that you find a couple of respite moments for yourself and any other caregiver in the home each day. To start with, if there's more than one caregiver in the home, I highly recommend making a schedule where you take time to plot out trade-off time for caregiver responsibilities. This puts everyone on the same page and everyone has the same shared expectation. It also provides you with a guide map or a visual schedule for the week that ensures that you know when you need to trade off and take a few minutes to yourself. Now is the time to really embrace screen time. Typically, we don't encourage our children to be on screen for many periods of the day, but these are unusual times and they do call for unusual conventions. This may be particularly important for those who have multiple children in the home. Screen time is a really great source for respite. It's a period of time that you can put your child in a room safely and provide them with something that will preoccupy them for a length of time that allows you to go and do something else. So for those of you who are caring for multiple children, this may be a way to spend some one-on-one -on -one time with the other children in the home. This will reduce that feeling of um, guilt that many parents feel when they're not providing the same level of support from one child to another. When all else fails, this is a really great time to say, let there be mess. Uh, set up a sensory table in your kitchen. You can do this safely and with little cleanup by simply removing everything in the room beforehand that can be dirtied, that can be destroyed, um, that you wanna protect and move it out of the way. For the rest of the space, take garbage bags, cut them open and cover your countertops and your table spaces with these garbage bags. Then you can go online, download several different types of mess sensory type activities. This could be things like slime, Play-Doh, anything with rice or sand, and set up different activities on your table. Then allow your children to just play and engage. It's a really great way for you to be able to take a step back, have a cup of coffee, maybe phone a friend, maybe catch up on your emails, and your kids are busy, they're doing something fun, and they're also doing something that engages their sensory uh, input. At the end of the day, you can use this as an opportunity to teach a life skill and you can work with your children to clean up the mess at the end of the day. The beauty is you've pre-prepared your environment so there's very little mess. All you have to do is roll everything up in your garbage bags and throw it in the bin. 
For those of you who get really busy in the day and sometimes even forget to take a moment to have a drink, try setting an alarm to remind you to take a break. A really good trick to set an alarm to is so that it goes off on the 50th minute of each hour. Then for the last 10 minutes of each hour, you commit yourself to using that time to practice a self-care activity. By doing this in an eight hour day, for example, by the end of that day, you have prote protected and secured yourself 80 minutes of respite. And that's something as little as 80 minutes per day in a work day. We know the weather is getting much warmer now and children and adults are really getting antsy and want to get outside. This is a great time to practice some of those activities that improve your physical health. So take a family trip outside and do something that involves some sort of group respite activity. That could be something like riding a bike. It could be going for a hike together. It could even be downloading some community scavenger hunt activity sheets, which you can download on something like a Google image search and splitting up into teams in the family. Break apart and go in different directions and see which team can find all of the items on their list and get back to the house first. One way to do this safely without the risks of COVID contamination is to simply take a photo of the item that you find rather than picking it up and bringing it back. When you get back to the house, it's a great time to engage with your family, to have a little uh, sportsmanship and to teach your children what good sportsmanship looks like, but also have a little bit of fun. For those of you that have the space of things like driveways and yards, things like making an obstacle course um, is a great way to get that physical activity going with your kids. And it's also a great way for you to get your physical activity in for the day. If you're not feeling up for it, simply set up your kids with a bunch of activities on the driveway and you can take a sip, sit back and have a rest. And it's a great way for everybody to get a little bit of vitamin D in, in the day, especially now in these sunny warm days really great activity that you can do together as a family is have a yoga circle in your family room. Simply move the furniture out of the way, remove any sharp objects, and cover all corners with pillows, blankets, and anything soft that will prevent someone from getting hurt should they fall on it. Find a YouTube clip that you really enjoy, download an app, or simply create your own routine for practicing yoga and have a yoga circle together. It's a great self-care activity that not only targets your physical needs, but also provides you a little bit of a mental reprieve. The good thing about this activity is that in the event that your child gets up and decides to wander during the activity, you've pre-prepped the environment to be safe so you can knowingly continue on and finish your yoga practice knowing that your child is safe because you have removed any dangers. Another way to really get some fun activity in without leaving the house is to do something like an adapted living room dance. This is a YouTube link to a, a video of a mother and daughter duo who provide in-person dance instruction during the year. Understanding that they can't host anymore, they decided to bring it online and they've shared it out with everybody in the community. This is a really great activity to do with your kids because it requires that everybody get up and get physically active. There's simple dance steps to follow along that anyone can do. And the beauty of it is that some of the steps have been adapted by one of the presenters so that even if you require some adaptations for physical needs, there are some examples there for you to follow. When in doubt, making a sensory bin is always going to be a great way to engage those sensory loving kids. You can even create bins with different objects and place them in different rooms to provide yourself and your child a bit of time where the sensory bins can be used to give you respite. Your child can wander from room to room engaging in every bin and try and put different objects in each bin so that it is really engaging. While you take a few moments here and there to have a cup of coffee, make a call, read a book, or watch those few minutes of Oprah or Dr. Phil that you've been dying to watch. At the end of the day, when you're trying to wind down, a really great activity that you can do with your kids is to create some stargazing, but do it inside. So go onto Amazon and purchase a glow in the dark star kit. You can typically buy them for about $10. When they arrive, find a room in the house, preferably the one with the biggest bed, 
and proceed to tack the stars onto your ceilings and the edges of your walls. They come with sticky tack that can be removed safely and easily without taking the paint off the walls. Leave the room and leave the lights on for at least an hour to give your stars the chance to charge. Then when your kids have done their bath time and you're getting ready to unwind, come into the room together, lay down on your backs with your face facing the ceiling, turn off the lights and proceed to have your own starry night in your own room. Now you can take the opportunity to play some soft music and to stargaze with your child. You can either engage with your children and enjoy the quiet time where you can cuddle and watch the stars together, or you can simply lay alongside your child and take a few minutes quietly to yourself. This is a really great activity for those kids who need a little bit more support with that unwinding at the end of the day and that self-reg. It calms the nervous system with the quietness, the lights down, and it's a really great way to get every kid ready for bed. This is an activity that can be enjoyed by every and any age, and it's something that's simple and easy, but also quiet and mess-free that can be done in the home. While we don't usually say this, now is the time to embrace technology. We know our kids work really hard all year long to build important relationships with their peers, and we know that this can be a very stressful time when they're isolated and don't have access to those important social groups that they have worked so hard to create. So we encourage all caregivers to use technology to connect their children to their peers as much as possible. This can be done by simply arranging video dates with another parent. A great way to incorporate respite into your day, especially if you're a single caregiver, is to arrange virtual play dates with other caregivers and take turns monitoring the event. So what we suggest is you get into a group of five or six different family households. This can be peers that your children have made at school, perhaps it's some families on the street, or anywhere else that your kids have developed some social support circles. Arrange a time and keep that time the same from week to week. This provides you a little bit of a routine and structure and also gives your child something to look forward to each week. This can also later be used as a reinforcer to get your kids to do a little bit of that schoolwork that they need to be motivated to do. Set up a schedule for shifting off and set up that each family is in a room with a video camera and at least one caregiver. Let's say you have a family group of about six different families. What you can do is you can arrange a schedule of trade-off of every 10 minutes. So every 10 minutes, two of the six families can step out of the room and leave their child on camera for the other parents or caregivers to watch. This will give you 10 solid minutes for yourself to go and take a little bit of break and do whatever you need to do, knowing that your child is still being monitored safely by someone in the group. In the event that you're needed to return to the room urgently, one of the other caregivers who's monitoring the room can simply give you a call on your phone and let you know that you need to go back. You can do this through a period of an hour or so, giving every caregiver in the group at least two opportunities to trade off and take some time away. It's a great way to keep your kid engaged, allow them to see their friends as frequently as possible, and it gives you a network of support with other caregivers who are going through the same things. This is also something that can be used with your external support system. So we know now with no access to respite breaks or any other supports, lots of families are missing that extended support system that usually chips in to help out. Whether it's an aunt or uncle, a grandparent or a respite worker, we know that these people are very heavily relied upon during the day to support our caregiving needs for our children. This can be a very stressful time right now as we do not have access to those supports. So setting up a virtual meeting with one of those support systems and setting your child up in front of a video where they can be engaged is a great way for you to take a break. So using the same concept as the virtual play date, set your child up in front of a video and set them up to have a little bit of a play date with one of their support networks. Perhaps it's a grandparent. Have grandmother and grandfather sit on the video with your child and engage them in activity while you step out of the room and go somewhere to take a bit of a break in the house. This will allow your child to connect with others that they have worked hard to build relationships with. It will give you a break to take some time to yourself. And in the event something arises and you need to return to the 
room, you're capable of doing so with a simple phone call from grandma or grandpa letting you know that it's time to go back. We highly encourage those of you who are caregiving on your own to arrange something like this as it's a great way to find respite in your day when you're not able to leave the home and nobody else is able to come in and help. Another great way to take a break is to have a family movie night. Why not get the family together, cuddle up on the couch, make some popcorn and enjoy something funny together, or simply get your kids set up to watch something that they really enjoy and take a step out while you enjoy a good 45 minutes to an hour of solo time to catch up on some of that self care. For those of you who have children that enjoy playing in the water, now is a really great time to embrace those water loving kids. So your kid likes to take a bath, why not schedule several bath times in a day? That's several times a day that you can supervise your child safely by being in the room, but they can be engaged and preoccupied with something they enjoy so that you can take a few minutes to yourself. Maybe have a glass of wine or a cup of coffee. Perhaps you want to take the time to paint your nails since you're in the bathroom anyway. Call a friend or catch up on a book. Do anything that you would like to do that you feel will help you with some self-care. It's a great way to incorporate those respite moments and to do so in a manner that your child will really enjoy. Now that SSAH and Passport have expanded some of their eligibility uh, criteria for using their funding, we highly recommend purchasing an indoor trampoline for those children who have that extra energy that needs to be exuded. Set up that safe corner in your house, similar to what you did with the yoga circle, and allow your child to spend the time jumping and exuding out all that extra energy that they have. This will give you a little bit of time to take that much needed break. As we suggested before, keep your household on a regular schedule from Monday to Friday, and that should include wake up and bedtimes. The reason we recommend this is that you can schedule in 30 to 60 minutes of me time at the beginning of and end of each day before and after your children go to bed. This is one way to guarantee that you take care of yourself for a little bit each day. As we mentioned before, dance parties are great ways to get your activity loving kids up and about. It's also a great way for you to get some of that physical fitness in. So remember, we're trying to lower those cortisol levels. Journaling is actually a really great self care technique that doesn't require that you remove your attention from your child. Keep a journal nearby and whenever you have some of those negative or intrusive thoughts entering and creeping in into your day, take a minute and write them down. Close the book and put it away and let that be that symbolic gesture that allows you to attend to the thought, accept what the meaning behind it is, and then to put it away and think positively for the rest of the day. Additionally, for those of you who can, we recommend that you co-create a schedule for each day with your loved ones. While doing so, incorporate in that schedule breaks for you. Have a conversation with your loved ones about the expectations around that break. So for example, perhaps it is a break that occurs three times a day and you work with your child that for 10 minutes three times a day they will get screen time but mom or dad will get a break and that means while they play on their screen mom or dad need to be left alone for that time so they can do something that they enjoy as well the more you include your children in these conversations and in, in these planning sessions the more likely they are to respect that time when you need it to yourself we do recognize that this is not going to be doable for every child and every caregiver, but where possible, try and incorporate your loved ones into those discussions and those scheduling of the day. And finally, before we go, we just wanted to share some of those fun activities and games that you can play with your kids and anybody can do this. And it's a really great way to have some fun, which as we know, is a really great self-care strategy. So when all else fails, build a fort in your house. This is a great activity that can engage everyone in the family. You can either do it individually and you can compete against one another by having everyone set up their own fort in their own rooms, or you can do a group activity where you try and make a castle type fort. And you can simply do that by clearing some furniture and moving some space in some common areas. It's a great activity. It doesn't require any more than some pillows and blankets, some empty laundry basket, maybe some extra 
extra empty boxes that you have laying around the house. Anything that can prop up a layer of drapery and then you can spend some time decorating it inside with your child. It's a really great activity and it can bring you hours of play. As we said before, mess and sensory activities are a really great way to engage your kids. So take some time to make some flubber and slime or get together and make some Play-Doh. You can make some homemade Play-Doh of different colors by simply dropping in different colored shades of food coloring into your homemade dough. Playing board games together is a lot of fun. As we know, Hasbro often says, have a board game night with your families. So for those of you who have kids who do enjoy those sort of competitive games, pull out your Monopoly or any one of your classic board games, put them out and have some fun together. For those who have children who really engage in building and putting puzzles together, you can purchase some 3D Lego sets or a 3D puzzle, and that's a great way to keep your kids or yourself engaged. It's also a great way to practice those fine motor skills. For those of you who have pets at home, simply playing a game of fetch with your family pet can bring you hours of laughter and fun, which helps you release a lot of that stress that you're carrying on with you during the day. If you have kids at home that like to bake and cook, why not bake and cook together? Watch some shows on Tasty App, for example. And those are little 30 second clips that show you how to put a meal together. They're lots of fun and they're very kid friendly. Maybe do that together with your kids once a day. And that's also a great life skill. If you have a yard, you can also take the same ideas and apply them to gardening outside. When you are looking for something fun and educational to do, why not download some fun science experiments? Of course, the messier the better. And when all else fails, we refer back to our four Bs. Balloons, bubbles, and bouncy balls are always a great way to get your kids engaged. Wellness Services at Surrey Place offers over 100 in-person and live virtual events each month. To register, please visit mysurreyplace.ca. View our calendar of events and go ahead and create an account for yourself so that you can register for the free events that are of interest for you. We also offer many additional recorded events and hundreds of resources that may be of interest to you. Recorded events and resources are also available to view for free at a time most convenient for you at surreyplace.ca backslash resources. We invite you to join the Family Connections group by visiting the Facebook group on your screen here. The link can also be found below in the description. We really hope that you enjoyed this free wellness event. Please take a moment to complete a brief survey by taking a picture of the QR code that you see here on your screen with your mobile device or by clicking the link in the description below. Thank you so much. Have a great day.